Hi guys, this video is about structs in C. I will first motivate structs with our compiler project, how we can use structs there for improving the interface of our Lexer. Then I also want to give you some technical background about structs. And then finally, I also want to show you how structs can be used for implementing single linked lists. In the header file for the Lexer, we currently declare three global variables that belong together because they contain information about the token that was found by a previous call of get token, the token kind and its position in the source file, the line number and the color number of this token. The fact that these variables belong together, we currently express with some coding style convention. They all begin with a prefix token underscore. And with structs, we now can achieve the same thing, having these three variables, but we can use a language feature to express that these variables belong together instead of a coding style convention. For that, we can declare a new data type, struct token. And in this declaration, we specify that variables of this type struct token always will have three members, kind, line, and column with a certain type. Then we can declare just one variable token of this type struct token. And this now means that we have one variable with three members, which we can access as follows with this notation name of the variable dot name of the member. And this means technically we again have three variables, but these three variables belong together because they are members of the same variable. Now, of course, we can go even one step further. For example, the position of a token consists of its line number and its column. So we also could group together the line number and the column number of a token by declaring another struct, a struct token pos with two members. Then, of course, we change the declaration of this struct token so that it now just has two members, a member for the token kind and a member for the position in the source file. And then we can access, for example, the line number of a token with token.post.line. So we can give this variable more structure as before. And we can most of all use a language feature to express how things belong together. If you want to write things a bit more compact, you also can declare a new data type, struct something and a variable of this type in one sweep. So for example, like this, we would declare a new struct token and uh, declare a variable of this type. And of course, that also means uh, for this member pos, we can insert the declaration of this struct token pos in this uh, declaration of struct token like that. And now it's up to you whether you find this more expressive or whether you want to split things, that you want to separate the declaration of a struct and the declaration of variables of this struct. Now, let me also give you an example that shows that in C, this user-defined structured data types are treated like regular built-in data types. In this example, we declare a new data type, struct foo, with three members, A, B, and C. All of them have the type int. And we define two variables, x and y, of this type, struct foo. Variable x is a global variable and variable y a local variable. Now, both of these variables are uninitialized. And here you have to recall that if you have an uninitialized global variable, it will be zero initialized before the program execution actually even begins. This zero initialization happens when the program gets loaded into memory. Now, what does it mean that a structured variable is zero initialized? It simply means that all its members are zero initialized. That means we know the initial value of all these members, x dot a, x dot b, x dot c. They are all zero. The local variable y lives on the stack, and here it's unspecified what the initial values of its members are. That means we do not know actually in advance what printf will actually print out for these members of y. If you want to initialize a variable, when you define it, you can do this, like for built-in types, uh, you also can do this for structured uh, types. Uh, you simply have to use this notation with this curly parenthesis, where within the curly parenthesis, you list the initial values of these variables. And here again, it's important to know that if you initialize a global variable, this initial value has to be a constant. And this is, of course, also true for structured variables. If you have a 
structure that is nested, and then you also can initialize this. Then you also have simply to nest this curly parenthesis. And you will find examples for that on the website. You also can assign a structured variable to another structured variable if they both have the same type, like in this case. Uh, that simply means that all these members will be copied. And this, of course, now means that uh, when you print out the members of Y, you actually print out these initial values uh, of X. You also can use structured data types as a parameter type in a function and also as return type. And you also will find examples for that on the website. Here it's in particular important to recall that in C, function calls are called by value. That means the function receives a copy of its parameters. And this will be in particular important if these members, for example, are pointers. Then you do copy the content of this pointer. That means the address stored in this pointer. And you do not copy the data behind this pointer. And for that, you will also find examples on the website. Let's also talk about the technical background, how a C compiler has to deal with structured variables. Like every variable, a structured variable has an address and a size, and these informations are known at compile time. The compiler uh, is doing some bookkeeping for every variable, and in particular, it keeps track of what's the address of this variable and what's its size. And you can access this information by using the address operator and the size of operator. And of course, you can use the size of operator together with the data type or the identifier for this variable, like here. Then, of course, the size of a structured variable depends on the size of its members, but it also will depend on the alignment requirements for a particular platform. Now, in this example, uh, this alignment requirement actually will be not relevant. And this is true because all these members have the same type int. The size of this structured variable will be three times the size of an integer, and these members will come in memory after each other. But let's be a bit more specific. Let's talk about the ULMC compiler and the ULM platform. There, an uh, integer has the size of two bytes and an uh, alignment requirement. This two bytes of an uh, integer need to be located at an address which is a multiple of two. That means the ULMC compiler has to make sure that the address of foo is at a multiple of two. Then we also can be even more specific. We can talk about the assembly code that will be generated by the WIMC compiler. In this example, foo is a global uninitialized variable, so it has to be zero initialized. That means it has to be located in the BSS segment. So here the WIMC compiler will generate a code fragment like that. And this simply means that we will have a label for this variable, which is aligned. And after this label, some uh, bytes zero initialized for this members, in this case, six bytes. If this global variable is initialized, like here, then it simply means that this um, assembly code is for the uh, data segment generated. And in the data segment, we then will have a label for this variable, also aligned, uh, of course. And after this label, we have these initial values uh, for these members. Let's extend this previous example to see what additional bookkeeping needs to be done by a compiler. And this will also help you in the assembly programming part of the lecture where you have to do these uh, things by yourself. Every member of a structured variable has a fixed offset relative to the address of this structured variable. So in this case, we have three offsets. And if we talk about the ULMC compiler and the ULM platform, the offsets are 0, 2, and 4. If you have an assignment that overrides a member, like here, then you have to compute the address of this member and you, of course, already know the size of this member. And then you have to store at this address, which is the address of foo plus zero, this uh, value. If you want to overwrite the second member, then the address of the second member is the address of foo plus two. And there you store this value. And the same, of course, for the third member. The address of the third member is simply the address of foo plus four, plus the offset. So far, in all examples, the size of a structured variable was always the sum of its member sizes. And when we looked at the memory layout, there was no gap between members in memory. And in general, both is not the case. In general, the size might be larger and there might be a gap between members. And this is due to alignment requirements. The 
compiler has to make sure that every member of a structured variable is properly aligned. And also if you have an array of structured variables, the members of this array elements, of course, also should be properly aligned. In this example, we will see that the UMC compiler has to make sure that a variable of type struct foo is aligned to four so that all its members are properly aligned. And this will require some padding bytes between some of these members. It will also require some padding bytes at the end of the struct. And to understand this, uh, why some padding bytes are also needed at the end of the struct, let's consider an example where we have an array of struct foo variables with two uh, elements. Then uh, if each of these array elements is aligned to four, the offset um, for this first member simply would be zero, and then this first member is properly aligned. If the offset for the second member is chosen as four, the second member is also properly aligned, but this means that we have two bytes between the first and the second member, and these two bytes are called padding bytes, that make sure that the second member is properly aligned. Then the third member can come directly after the second member without some padding in between. But then after this third member, two bytes are required for padding so that the next array element is again properly aligned to four. And this means uh, in this case, we would have this memory layout for this two variables uh, in this array of struct foos. So what's in general the alignment requirement for a struct and what's in general the size of a struct? A struct should be aligned to the least common multiple of the alignment requirements for its members. Now, because all built-in types have an alignment requirement, which is always a power of two, this um, actually simplifies a lot. The alignment requirement of a struct member is always a power of two because of that. And for that, we simply can take the maximum alignment requirement for one of its members. And the size of a struct is simply the sum of the member sizes rounded up to this alignment requirement. Early versions of C actually did not have structs. They were added later. And the reason why they were added was that it wasn't possible to implement Unix without structs. I will insert here a clip from an interview with Ken Thompson, the inventor of Unix, where he first talks about why a higher language compared to assembly was required for implementing Unix, why he failed to implement Unix with first versions of C where structs were not um, there, not available, and how he then asked the guy, the inventor of C, one of, his, one of his colleagues, to add structs to C to make it possible for him to actually implement Unix. Enough. Uh, at this point, uh, time had gone on, and we now had a PDP-11, and we started getting more memory for the PDP-11 so we could think about expansion. And we decided that we had to write Unix in a higher level language. It was just mandatory. This was all assembly language until then. So he started muting um, newbie into C uh, uh, with the, the, the big deal was types. He put types in, in B. B and, B and the old, old C were very, very similar language except for the, all the types. Uh, New, B only had words. You load, store, add, everything was words. And the PDP-11 was bytes. So something had to be done to not waste factor four on, on it. So anyway, I, long story short, all by himself, he converted that, made C. I, I then tried to rewrite the kernel in C, that, you know, whatever this current language was, which was called C. and. Uh, failed three times, three total complete failures, and uh, uh, being um, I, I, basically being an egotist, I blamed it on the language. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he'd go back and, and beef up the language for something, and then finally when structures came in the way that structures did come into the language, which was completely outside of B, B had nothing resembling structures. Uh, uh, the port to Unix of C t on the PDP-11 worked. You know, it was before that it was 
too complicated. I, I just couldn't keep it all together. And uh, so then there was as, uh, the first C version of Unix. And, uh, and C became a pretty, you had something to do with C, didn't you? I, <laughs> no, I had nothing to do with C. I twisted a guy's arm into writing a book, but that's the extent of my dog. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, um, shifting gears a bit, you, you started life as a, or some part of it, as an electrical engineer. So structs literally were hacked into the C programming language in a way that also reflects how structs were handled in assembly programming. From a struct declaration like here, the C compiler was generating some EQ directives for the offsets of its members, and if you then have a member, for example, on the left-hand side in an assignment, the assembly code for that would first load the address of this struct into a register, and then these symbols for the offsets would be used as a displacement, like here, for the store instruction. And this, of course, has the consequence that you cannot use the same identifier in a different struct, because then the offsets are, in general, different. So there was a limitation for that. What you had to do is you had to use some prefix for each member, a prefix that is somehow coupling the members of a struct to the struct itself. For example, if the struct was called uh, struct foo, you could use the prefix f underscore or foo underscore. And then, of course, things still would work. And this is actually still traceable in Unix nowadays. If you look at this man page, you see that this members still have this prefix, uh, which is coupling these members to the name of the struct. Of course, you will find on the website more information about structs, the complete grammar, and that you basically can use structured variables as these normal variables. You can assign them to each other. You can pass a structured variable as a parameter to a function. Then this function gets a copy of this variable. A function can return a structured variable. And then, of course, the caller also gets a copy of this returned value. So this is actually what you would expect from this new data type, that you can use variables of this data type, like variables uh, that we already know. What I want to show you actually next is how these structs can be used for creating data structures, like, for example, linked lists. The key for this data structure linked list, or in this case, actually, single linked list is a declaration like this here for a structure with, for example, two uh, members. And the important thing is that one of these members is a pointer to a structure of the same type that we are currently declaring. And C will allow that to use already this type that wasn't completely declared so far because we are just using this member to store an address of this type. So that means for the compiler, it's already clear that this member has a certain size, the size of addresses on this platform that it supports. In our case, for example, eight bytes, and it can compute all these offsets, and this type information will become clear after this declaration is completed. So this will be allowed. Now I can define a few variables of this type, and that will mean that I will have some variables in memory, in this case in the PSS segment, zero initialized because uh, these are global variables and now i want to initialize this uh, structured variables a b and c and of course this member id stands for identifier and this member next uh, is supposed to point to the next element in a list but let me show you how i will initialize this step by step so that you actually see that uh, meaning of a next pointer inside of this uh, structured variables I want to initialize this ID field, uh, similar to the name of this variable, just by using the characters A, B, and C. So I want to have the following in memory, and for that I will use these statements in the function main. And so this is easy to accomplish. Now, in the end, I want to have the following. A should be the first element of this list, and its successor should be B, and the successor of B should be C, and C should be the last element of this list. Now, to achieve that, I will first change a.next into a pointer to b. And 
For that, I simply have to store the address of B in a.next because pointers are just addresses stored in variables. So that's it. And then of course I want that b.next points to C. So I store the address of C in b.next. And to express that C does not have a, another successor, I somehow have to indicate that c.next does not contain a valid pointer. And for that you need some convention. And the convention in C is that a null pointer indicates this is an invalid pointer. And that means if that we have accomplished it, to have a list with first element A, and it's somehow linked to the end, and the last element is C. Now, this is certainly not a technique to, in general, deal with lists, because you have to predefine all these list nodes uh, in the PSS or data segment. But basically, you will see this is the idea. And once we have dynamic memory allocation, we can generalize it. Let me briefly outline how, in general, we will set up data structures for implementing linked lists. For the data that we want to store in the linked list, we will declare one struct, like here, for example, a struct list element. And if we, with this more general pattern, would like to realize this special case from before, this struct then just would have one member, a member ID of type character. And then we will have another struct for the list nodes. And this always will have the same pattern. It will have two members. First, this member next with a pointer to the next list node and the member with the data that we want to store. So this member element. And if we want to actually realize this special case from before with global variables for the list nodes, then we exactly would do the same. We define three global variables and then we just have to do some minor modifications for setting the data in this list. Let me also show you what you actually have to do in the next assembly programming assignment. Basically, I will show you here the implementation in C, and you just have to do the same in assembly. So it's kind of a cheat sheet. First, you have to set up the example from before, so this should not be too difficult. But then you also have to implement a function for printing a list. That means um, the declaration for that is now shown here. This function print list gets a pointer to a list node, and you call it from function main with a pointer to the first list node. And then, of course, in this case, it should pre print A, B, and C. And actually, in the assignment, you also should print, in addition, some new line after that, so that we have some nice output. And now, of course, the question is how to implement such a function, print list. And I just show you the C implementation for that. So this is the implementation of this function print list in C. This function has one parameter, a pointer to a list node. And because we call this function from function main with the address of A, this parameter list node will point to this list node A. And then we have this for loop without an init clause. That means we right away just check the condition of this for loop. Should we enter the loop body or not? If list node is zero, we will not, and otherwise we will. Now, because list node is just storing the address of some variable in the PSS segment, it certainly will not have the value zero. So we will enter the loop here. And then we have to understand this expression where we dereference first the pointer. And dereferencing this pointer means that we actually now talk about what is at the end of this pointer. That means this list node itself. And this is a struct, so it has members. And here we fill print the member ID of this list node. That means we print the character A. And then we have this update expression in the for loop, which comes next. And here we simply overwrite list node with the value stored in the current node in the member next. That means after that, list node will point to the list node B. And then we again just repeat things. We first check, is list node now a null pointer? No, certainly not the case. That means again, we enter the loop body. That means again, we print the stored element. Then again, we will update. That means now this node points to this node C. And then again, we check, is this a null pointer? Also not the case. So that means again, we enter the loop. We print again the element. Then we again update this node. Now it actually will be a null pointer. 
That means now the condition is false and then we basically return from this uh, function. And that's basically it. That's almost it for this video. I just want to point out again that on the website you find more information about structs, grammar related to structs, and most of all some use cases, um, how you can take advantage of that for having a more expressive code. And what is ugly in this implementation of printlist is this um, notation that I have to use for accessing members of a dereference pointer to a struct. You have to use here parentheses because postfix operators always have a higher proceeding than the prefix operators. So if you first want to dereference a pointer to a struct and then access a member, you have to do it like that. Or you use shortcuts that are luckily provided by C. This shortcut here is this notation with this arrow. And this is exactly equivalent to each other. The arrow notation means that you first dereference a pointer to a struct and then access its member. And that means you can rewrite this print list function from this ugly form into this nicer form. So that's now actually it for this video. Bye.